So uh, jo uh, for those who don't know, uh, uh, well, why don't you describe it, Jaws? What, what's your, what are your responsibilities at Apple? So I lead uh, product marketing, product management for iPhone, iPod, iOS, iCloud, things like that. And what that means at Apple is we work with our executive team and our engineers on what the product's going to be, what are the feature sets going to you know, be of those products, what price points do we want to hit, uh, collectively come up with what the product's going to be. We then uh, work with engineering to the development of those products because inevitably there's some choices and recommendations need to be made and we'll bring a market perspective into that, into that conversation. And then we become the people that help tell the story of a product. Right? We'll come out and talk to folks like yourselves. Uh, we talk to our own Mar Marcom and advertising people and help create the stories that they're going to turn into amazing marketing. Uh, so we're, in one way, the market's voice to Apple, and then in another way, Apple's voice to the market and the products that we create. So um, you have a bunch of stuff you cover. I think you also deal with Apple Pay, too. That's, that's correct. So there's lots of stuff. And uh, so let's, let's start with phones. Okay. So you just announced you sold a, a, a record number, a very high number mm -hmm. of iPhones uh, in the last quarter. The iPhone 6 was only a couple of weeks of that quarter, right? Mm -hmm. um, That's correct. 10 million in the first week. So how many iPhone 6s have you sold so far? A lot. Yeah. No, but how many? <laughs> uh, I can't give you a precise number. A lot of analysts would love to know that, but you, you know we're still trying to catch There's up. There's no with analysts that. here. Yeah, we're still trying to catch up with the man. It's been a huge launch for us. Those are the biggest advancements, as we've said, iPhone ever. Uh, we had an just because you made the screens bigger. Or? Well, there's, it's bigger than bigger, Walt. You know that. It's not just. <laughs> it, oh, not that's just, the slogan. Okay. It's not just a bigger display. It's a better display, and it's actually iPhones better in every way. And I, I've seen so many out here. Thank you uh, for having those. It's it's been a big deal for us, and we are selling a lot. We're trying to make as many as we can, and we still haven't caught up yet. Okay, so last night uh, John Ledger uh, said that he and presumably his team at T-Mobile were surprised at the ratio. They were surprised at how, how much of their total uh, iPhone 6 mm -hmm. uh, uh, sale, sell through has been the, the plus, the, the bigger model. Is that generally been the trend? In all honesty, we don't know yet. They're, we're we're oh, come on. Sell, no, we're, no, we're, no, we're the selling minute. them in the ratio that we're making them, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're behind on everything. We're gonna have to get to a point of some steady state of some equilibrium between supply and demand to know where that's going to settle but up. But you can already we, tell. We I mean, don't. the carriers have to be telling you, look, this is where our orders are coming in. I know you're selling everyone you can make, but that's why the backlog is greater you, for the you, 6 You really plus. don't know. You don't know until you're going to get to equilibrium. Also, the other part that I always remind anybody who looks at forecasting, anybody who's looking at it, and we do that as well, is you have to also make sure that you understand the steady state market versus the early adopter market. Mm -hmm. So I, in all honesty, it's too early to tell. Yeah, Just flatly. I think it will, as Tim talked about in the earnings call, it will vary by region. You know, just if you look at at least competitive data, it varies pretty significantly by region. Meaning what? Big screens are more popular in Asia. Exactly, and, and less popular in Europe, and the U.S. ends up somewhere in between. Okay. So one of the interesting things you guys did this time around with the, with the iPad that just launched is this Apple SIM. And I'm curious what, you know, we kind of all saw it and said, oh, that's really interesting. You, this mm -hmm. is the thing where on the new iPad, if you buy it from certain channels through Apple Direct, um, it comes with one SIM, and you can choose T-Mobile or Sprint or AT&T, not yet Verizon. What, what was it, why were you guys doing that, and what was important to you? Like most things for us, Ian, it's about the customer experience. And if you're going to buy it from us, we ultimately don't know who you're going to use as a carrier. And we wanted to make it as easy as possible on our customers who are buying an iPad and are going to make up their mind later as to what carrier they're going to use if they want to have cellular reception. And so we created an ability to have a SIM that could work with multiple carriers. John Laguerre seemed to like it last night. but uh, And it yeah. not only lets you work with both, but the, the idea, at least the way it was described on the website, is that you could even switch between them if you yeah, wanted like to change. If you had at and and you didn't like it theoretically, you should be able to switch to, this is why he likes it, mm -hmm. obviously. You could, it should be able to switch to T-Mobile or Sprint or if Verizon had they participated. But this is my question for you. You can invent all this stuff, and I presume you did it, you told the carriers. Maybe you didn't, I don't know. But the carriers don't seem to be crazy about it. AT&T is locking you in. Verizon's not participating. So here you tried to do something you, you say is for customers. 
but it doesn't actually get to customers because somebody in the middle, the carriers, is... Well, we do have carriers who are participating, and I think anything that's new, people sometimes want to stop and evaluate and see how it's going. We think it's pretty great. Customers are using it pretty great, and John loved it. Is it something yeah. you'd like to see... <laughs> You know, used more broader, even potentially on phones. We haven't we haven't talked about that. We're really just looking at it is because you buy an iPad without the carrier. If you buy it in our store, you know, if you go to AT and T store, it's pretty obvious what you're going to run on an iPad or an AT and T store. When you're going to buy it in our stores, it's unclear. You know, and we want to make it easy on a customer to decide. You know, once they get home, who do they want? Why not put it in a phone? Again, most iPhones by far are sold through carriers. You know that. Right there, you know, we sell direct a lot less iPhones than, for example, the ratio of iPads that we would sell direct. So, but still a lot people of are, people are buying their uh, largely buying phones through carriers. Uh, we'd love to have them buy more from us, by the way, but they're buying them primarily through the carriers. So there's, th so it's not as valuable because, as you, as you just finished saying, if you're in the Verizon store, you're you're there basically to buy a. An iPhone, if, and you're buying an iPhone, yeah. you're going to buy it on Verizon. Doubt you're going to go to the Verizon store and say, can you hook me up with AT&T? Right. But here's yeah. the thing that Ina mentioned is the change thing. So if I were, even if I bought it at the mm -hmm. Verizon store, if it was this changeable mm -hmm. Apple SIM and I got annoyed at them or mm -hmm. I moved somewhere where the coverage was mm -hmm. or I got a different job and the coverage wasn't any good and I said, oh, now I want to switch to Sprint or AT&T, that would be cool to have on the phone. Uh, I think, again, the coolest thing for the iPad folks are the fact that they don't necessarily know when they walk out the store who they want to use as a carrier. And we're making that convenience just super simple to decide later. It, you know, changing's part of it, but I think the biggest part is that initial, who am I going to use? All right, let's talk for a minute about iOS. Um, uh, so uh, two things. Um, one is you... You went to uh, iOS 7, which was a big change in the look and feel. You went mm -hmm. to uh, iOS 8, which has uh, all this continuity stuff where you can mm -hmm. uh, interact with a Mac uh, or an iPhone can interact with an iPad. I, mean, I was literally sitting on my back porch. My iPad was in another room in the mm -hmm. house charging. And a phone, my iPad started ringing. And it wasn't a FaceTime mm -hmm. ring. It was a a phone call ring and it, cool, it? came up and it said, well, it, my, my wife was like, why is your iPad ringing? And it was a call, said who it was, said mm -hmm. through your iPhone and we were able to have a phone call. So that's cool. Um, but the, you, you also ran into a s situation where you did a patch to iOS 8 and mm -hmm. it actually, it actually, it, it didn't do too much damage to some phones. It merely made them unable to make phone calls or essentially work. So, how did that get through? It's a retro experience. Did I? Just to remind you of that how early did experience. that get through? Did, did I mention we, Walt and I have been working together almost 20 years? Well, and, uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful relationship. It is, it is. He's, but, but, and for almost 20 years, I've been saying things like this. Yeah, I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, the how reality that is that happen? obviously was a mistake. And it was, it was an issue with some certs. It wasn't an issue with the software itself. It was the way the software was, was distributed. Uh, we very quickly, as you know, it was about an hour that that existed out there. We found it, we pulled it back, uh, and then quickly released an 802. Um, you know, very sorry. But how did it get thing. through your QA? Yeah, again, it had to do with the way the software was actually being sent over servers. It wasn't the software itself, it was the way it was being distributed. And kind of along those lines, um, first of all, I, I, since I bugged you about it for so long, I would be remiss. I love the fact that in iOS 8, you can switch between keyboards, both mm -hmm. the work that you guys did on the keyboard, but then opening it up. That said, it's still a challenging experience. Um, some of the problems got fixed in the early. It still happens where I open the email app and there's no keyboard at all. Is that just a tough thing to do? Are you seeing that on 8.1? Yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let, let's, let's talk okay. later, because not um, to try to uh, duck it, but I mean, hopefully it's something that we, we've resolved. Uh, you know, you're gonna, whenever you're pushing software and, and doing some very advanced things, you're gonna, find, you're gonna make some mistakes, you're gonna have some hiccups. What we try to do is very quickly fix them, and I think you've seen that from us. And do you think some of this is, my sense is that some of this is you know, other, carrier, other hardware makers, other software, it just gets tested longer and more publicly. Part of Apple's culture is you don't release the product until nearly it goes on sale. But that's not the case with iOS 8, right? Because we started seeding that in June. 
to right. developers. Uh, to, well, to developers, but the reality is, well, you know, a lot of people call themselves developers uh, so they can get early access to this thing. And, and we do get a lot of feedback, and occasionally you didn't get feedback in an area that you wanted it, but this stuff does go through a pretty long public period of people testing. And okay, generally, it's worked very well. I just, I do have to say this. I do think there, w there are a number of cases, some of them seem small, some of them are bigger, where Apple's QA has been called into question in the last couple of years. I can't list every one. I, if you gave me a couple of days, I'd send you an email. I've done this. I'm sure you have. Uh, and <laughs> list every one. <laughs> and it's true. I mean, he, uh, he knows this. And, and you're, it's, it's fine. It, software's complicated. I get it. What you just said is fine. And you do try mm -hmm. to fix them. But you're the company that is A, mm -hmm. the premium company that charges a lot of money for all your products, and B, you're the company that says it just works. That's kind of in your DNA. It's kind of what mm -hmm. Apple is about to people. And so when you, it, it, when you do something which makes people scratch their heads and say, where, why, how could it be possible that the keyboard isn't here when I open mail, or why does the phone get bricked, or you know, what's the deal? It's, it's, a, it's a more serious thing when it's you because you've set yourself up as this company that doesn't make those kinds of mistakes. You, it, you, it, it's not so, acceptable when we do. Well, the reality is we don't make many of them. Uh, when we do make them, we recover very quickly. I think we issue new software and a software update when we find something like that. And by the way, our software updates, as you know, get extraordinarily quickly adopt it. I mean, our users do update, and that's something that on other platforms is not even an option. Talking about that broad ecosystem, I mean, mm -hmm. one of the challenge, you know, historically, one of the things that's helped make iOS software development community really robust is, regardless of how many users Android had, a lot of the money being spent on software, on accessories, has been for the iPhone. And obviously, that, that will continue for some time. Does it trouble you, though, when you look out a couple of years that 19 out of 20 phones are going to be an Android phone, and that at some point, even if the average iPhone user spends more on software, there's going to be just so many more Android that you end up in no. uh, you know, You know, funny, you know, backstage we were talking about some mistakes that Apple made in the 90s, and some of it was trying to do things like making cheap products that were chasing market share instead of chasing a better experience. And, you make that mistake once in your life, you're not gonna make it twice. Our goal is to make the best products with the best experience and to try to make sure that we are delivering on that. And I think by and large, we do. Our customer satisfaction rates are higher than anybody's. Uh, and we have no shortage of either developers or customers. You know, we've sold somewhere over 600 million iPhones. We're you know, coming up on a, a billion iOS devices in, in near sight. We have over a million apps on the App Store. We have over 85 billion downloads. Developers still make more money on our platform than they do somewhere else. Uh, to us, it's about the experience. In this naive belief we have at Apple, and maybe it is naive, that if we just make a better product with a better experience, that there'll always be a healthy market for that. Healthy market doesn't mean it has to be, we have to be the 80% market share leader never been the goal. Our goal is the best experience. So on your list and there's of no And there's no level of share yeah, below would. which you could fall where you would be in trouble because there's just too few of, of iOS devices in the world relative to Android or whoever it is that, uh, who, uh, that it's not worth the developer's time. I, I think as long as we create, keep creating the best products, the best experience, that won't be a conversation anybody's going to have. And it's not a conversation anybody's having now. So in your list of, of biggest worries, the, the fact that it just seems likely that Apple's share of the market will be smaller as phones, many smartphones get cheaper and you guys... I'm not better. accepting that. That was your, your words. I'm saying we're going to create products with the best experience, and I think that that's always going to have a healthy market. I mean, people have said this about the Mac for years, and here we are now you know, still outgaining the PC market, a very mature market, right, that is contracting, you know, and Macs are growing by 20%. And, you know, people for 20 years, probably back to our briefings, Walt. Well, asked there aren't us, many Macs out here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, everybody's got a Mac out here, and people say, why aren't you trying to make, you know, a $200 Mac or something crazy? And the reality is, why don't you just create the best experience? We do that, everything always seems to follow that. Okay, um, let's talk about Apple Pay. Okay. So uh, by now, I'm sure everybody knows what Apple Pay is. It's not, it's, it's very, to me, it's, and I wrote it this way, it's classic Apple. 
in that you didn't invent it. There's a lot of the things you did that became hits for you that you didn't actually, weren't the first to invent. You, so people did it, they kind of failed or flailed around with it. Google was one of them, but not the only one. And you now have come up and said, okay, we're doing an NFC wireless payment system from the phone. And you did it, uh, our tests, and we used our whole team of Recode reviewers around the country were that it worked. And it worked really elegantly. You, you put the phone up near the terminal, if the store was properly equipped with that kind of terminal, and it just, you didn't have to launch an app, it automatically came on, it did the payment, great. Then, Saturday, <laughs> CVS, which is either, I don't know the numbers, but it's either the biggest drugstore chain in the country or the slightly second biggest behind Walgreens. They're essentially, I think, tied. Uh, they turned it off. They turned NFC off. So, we've, so Google Wallet doesn't work there either, however many people are still using Google Wallet. Uh, they turned it off. And they, and the, I did went and tested it myself on Saturday after having done it four or five times during the week, perfectly. The term, the iPhone said the transaction all went through. The terminal said another form of payment is required. Rite Aid did the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're in a consortium doing their own deal. So does this mean Apple Pay is going to fail because there's a whole bunch of merchants led by Walmart, which is gigantic, and Best Buy, and that, including CBS that are basically saying, you know what? We don't, want, we don't want your payment mechanism in our stores. So to go back to why we've been successful in places that maybe other people have gone before is we have this belief that we don't necessarily have to be the first to do something. We want to be the first to do it well. And to do it well means centering your experience around the customer. And that's what we did with Apple Pay. We made it fast. It's actually, you know, for most people, at least for me, and I think for 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 most of us in the room, I can get to my phone faster than I can get to my credit card, right? So it had to be faster than the credit card. It had to be more secure. Secure again. Security works on for a lot of folks. It works for me in that I'm not actually storing a credit card number here. There's nothing that can be stolen. That actually works for the merchant too, because as you know, there's been some pretty high pro pro profile uh, incidents where people have been intercepting numbers. That doesn't. That's not something that would you know, Apple Pay would be susceptible to. And it's private. You know, this is information that it's your business, what you bought, where you bought it, how much you paid for it, and not, and not ours. So, so we created that solution ar ar around the end user to have the best customer experience. Ultimately, we think that retailers who are going to be successful are going to work around their customers as well and, and, and accept payments that their customers want to use. We think we have a pretty good system. You think well, that in the face of these guys turning you off? Well, how pleased did that make you as their customer? Oh, I was pissed. I was all over Twitter being pissed. I heard that, yeah. So yeah. Why, why, do retail, why do some retailers, because there are plenty, you have a long list of people mm -hmm. that are not only existing NFC users, but you know, who are putting them in mm -hmm. so they can use it. But what is it that the retailers, is there something specific to Apple Pay they don't like? No, not, using not, 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 credit nothing card. at all. There's some disputes that have to do with interchange between some retailers and the credit card companies. And that's a battle we're not in, quite honestly. Uh, it's it's not in our interest to be anything but a, a neutral observer to that. But in, in starting Apple Pay, remember, we're starting. You know, this is the beginning of where we're going to go. We Obviously, a very nice start. You heard Tim talk about the fact that we had a million users activate in the first 72 hours, which is about a million users more than anybody else has had doing this sort of thing. Uh, you know, it was, it was about making sure that we had a critical mass of, of existing payment that could work for people. And you saw that we had the three major credit card networks. We started with the six largest banks and, and, and some additional ones on top of that. They gave us about 83% of credit card spend uh, in the United States, which was huge. People who had started some of these solutions didn't have any. You know, or made you have to go get a special credit card. People aren't going to do that. And then very quickly, we added 500 banks that signed on and said that they would be uh, adopting either very late this year or very early next year. That's great. That's huge. Again, some retailers have, have an issue with some of these credit card companies. It isn't really our battle, but they, I, I, perhaps, you know, something they have to take up with those guys. I notice you're wearing a watch, and I notice, if I'm seeing it correctly, it, it, it's got really good battery life, but few apps. Uh, <laughs> you want to hold it up? <laughs> well, I'm not going to do an advertisement for my... Uh, but Auto, I think it is. when you think about it, and I know Apple Watch itself isn't necessarily in your area, what, where do you see the watch fitting in in this connected ecosystem? So you, probably this is going to go mm -hmm. to some of your best customers that have iPads, that have iPhones. 
what is important about that extra space? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm not the watch guy. You're, you're right, so I would be careful not to. But you are the Apple guy. I know, here. we had this conversation. I told you that yes, last yes. night. Uh, got off to a pretty good start as far as the reception we got from it as a, as a revolutionary uh, computing device, because that's what it is, but also health, fitness, fashion, all embraced it, even without the Rick's round face to it. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, it, yeah, it, yours are square. It, it is square, which things tend to read better when they're square. Um, you don't have to trim the edges off of things. But but the, but they're not. Are they celibacy devices or what? <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe them on that? I don't even that? know how to get into that conversation with you. Oh Walt. come on, uh, <laughs> just easy. Are they? I they? love the fact the fashion industry, which I think is the tastemakers <laughs> in this area, is embraced. Okay. Apple Watch. I mean, you saw Tim very proudly at our last event show that we were on the cover of Vogue China. Um, that didn't look like, you know, somebody who was rejecting our, I don't even want to use some of your quotes <laughs> around there. <laughs> All my quotes are usable. But, um, so uh, who is it for, though? Because it's going to start at 350 bucks for a model that's aluminum and has a plastic band. You haven't given any other prices, and I'm assuming... I'd be very, I'd, I'd fall off the stage if you gave other prices, but, <laughs> but you're going all the way This to, is my chance? <laughs> but, this is your chance. I'll do it. I'll, <laughs> and to God, I'll do it. If he lists the price of every iteration of Apple Watch, I'll fall off the stage. And, and he doesn't- Throw in his ship date and I'll go too. And, and, <laughs> good. <laughs> We're together, right? All right. <laughs> and we'll come see you in wherever your next. And job I'm pretty is. sure at that point someone will throw you off the stage. Yeah. That's okay. Right. But the point is, uh, the minimum is 350, and if you're showing watches in 18 karat gold with really super fancy bands, I have to assume we're up into the thousands of dollars. I know you're not going to confirm it, but I'm I'm going to assert it. We're going to be up into thousands of dollars, maybe even ten thousand dollars by the time you trick it out as much as it can be tricked out. Who is it for? Who's it not for? I mean, Well, people, people that can't afford $10,000. Well, you don't, I, I am not saying that's the price, but you don't have to buy the rose gold model of it. I mean, part of that is to make sure that there were options for people because fashion is a big part of this. The, you know, the fact that this is something, you don't want everybody to walk into the room wearing the exact same watch. It'd be kind of bored. Be all walking in the same room wearing exact same clothes. It's not the way people want to Or everyone have. carrying like is one it? model of phone. <laughs> Having walked around here, I think that's been a pretty cool thing, actually, because it seems to be iPhone 6s and 6 Pluses. Uh, you know, so people ask us the same thing about the iPhone. You know, who's it for? And we were at the very early part of that smartphone uh, explosion, and, and obviously we, we think we had a pretty good hand in helping that explode. You know, I think we're doing the same thing here. I, I'm excited for it. It seems like people were pretty excited about what we announced last month. Uh, I think it is going to be something that's going to be one of these really huge devices, and I don't mean enough. Yeah, side. it's great, the, the Watch Plus yeah. is. Um, so one other area <laughs> that you guys are going into. Well, no, wait, can, can I stop yeah, you for yeah, a second? Yeah, go for it. You, I have not seen, and it could be that, they, that I've just missed it, but do you know anything about what was the decision to make two sizes? And they were very careful not to say men's and women's and all that, but you made the Apple Watch is going to have two sizes. Sa same idea. Again, it's about... I don't, I don't think the other guys making these smart watches have two sizes. Uh, probably not. But again, the same idea. It's about choice, about making sure you had a product that's going to look right for you, feel right for you. I don't know about you. you know, I, I kind of like a smaller watch, you know, as you can see here. You know, some people like a larger watch. We wanted to provide some choice for customers. Right. Lots of different bands, choices, styles. So one other area that Apple's heading into that mo hasn't... You've announced, but most people haven't really gotten to experience. You guys are doing some stuff in the car. Mm. Again, what's, what's the idea of CarPlay? Because yep. essentially, most, in order to work with CarPlay, a car has to already have its own nav system set up. There has to be a screen there. So most car makers are putting their own work on. And then mm. if you plug an iPhone in, then you get this CarPlay experience. Gr great question. For one, I, I should make a plug the fact that we have a couple cars out front uh, so anybody here that wants to go see them, especially at lunch, we have a couple people um, staffing them. We have an old car, an old 69 Camaro worth seeing in and of itself. And we have a Hyundai Sonata uh, out there running, both of them running CarPlay, uh, one through an aftermarket solution, obviously. The idea is a, a smarter, safer, more fun way to use your iPhone, we like to say, in the car. 
And that's because what we've done is we've made it so that you can use your iPhone with just your voice or minimum, a minimal amount of interaction with the touch screen. Now, touch screens are growing in cars. Uh, there's even some legislation, as you know, part of it got delayed, but that they would put screens in cars with a backup camera so you don't run over anybody if you're backing up. So that certainly has helped us. But the idea being that you know, people want to carry on with that experience that they love with their iPhone, and they don't want it to end just because you got into their car. And as you know, some of those experiences have been variable uh, with your phones, no matter whose it is. Because you've been working with car. car companies for, since the iPhone came out, and that's part, or even the iPod. Well, that's, I'd say that's part of the beauty of this. this is, these are not new relationships for us. These are more than decade-long relationships. We built iPod connectivity into cars starting you know, with BMW in 2004, and we got into well over 90. And I mean, we're talking the high 90% of cars that had iPod connectivity. So these are existing relationships for us. That means they're trusting relationships. They know we're we're not after their customers' data. Uh, you know, we, they know that what we're trying to do is create a better experience mutually for our customers in a car. So there's some trust as to where we're going and how we're going there. We work a lot with them to the point of them testing to the earlier point. You know, they test everything we're doing as far as CarPlay in their cars because distracted driving is a big deal and it's a big deal for them. They want to make sure that it hits both of our standards as we're putting this in. It's a great experience. It's the start. You know, it's the start. We released the very first version of it this year. We have over 30 brands who are committed to doing CarPlay. Uh, Ferrari was the first to ship, so Ina, if you want a Ferrari, they're shipping already. I uh, can expense that, right, Walt? <laughs> I need to test it. We're, we're off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> With CarPlay, Pioneer just started shipping. Alpine's about to start shipping. Uh, Honda, as I mentioned, is about to. Honda is, and we'll have a ton of brands coming out in 2015. It's a great way to use your iPhone on a car. I, I, I need to get your commitment on this. Will Siri be just as accurate in the car as it is in the hand? Walt, now, now, I, I know you're saying that with love in your heart. Uh, <laughs> Siri has gotten really good. Did you read the article in the New York Times? I know that's probably not In the what? Uh, yeah, the, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, talk about one that just kind of pulled at the heartstrings about this, uh, the, the author no, written about the, did, the, yeah. the kid with autism uh, who I read had, that had this real personal connection with Siri. I mean, Siri is a very personal thing. And, you know, and to your point, you know, early on in Siri, there were some issues with just the voice recognition part, which isn't the Siri magic, right? The Siri magic is once we do understand your words, is knowing what to do with them. And Siri's always been great at that. We've made that voice recognition better, faster over time. And, and I think that's one of the things that got written up nicely in iOS 8. And a lot of the reviews is how good Siri has gotten. And I, if you haven't given it a try, well, you may want to I've go given back it a try, try. Jess. <laughs> and, it's, and, and, it, and it still has some work to go. Still has some work too. Everybody here have perfect experience with Siri? Oh, come on, you can't ask it like that. Does everybody here have a perfect experience with Walt Mossberg? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna throw myself off the stage now. <laughs> All right. Just for that, let's talk about iPads. <laughs> you know I'm not the iPad I don't guy. care, you're Apple. You're an Apple vice president. <laughs> Question is, I'm gonna have to give you my business card after this. Why? Uh, why is? What's happening with tablets? What, or and uh, and particular what's happening with iPads? Why are sales falling? I mean, they went like a rocket, and they've been falling the last few quarters. What's going on? Well, again, we just released the new iPad Air 2, which is uh, without a doubt the best iPad we've ever made. Touch ID is uh, in and of itself going to be huge, but it is it is thinner, it's faster, you know, it does everything better. I think that that's that's great. I mean, iPads, I mean, you act like it's, it's not succeeding. We sold 225 million in the, in the first few years, which was more than we had sold iPhones in its first few years. I mean, it's, it's done quite well. And, and I love the chart that the, the iPad guys used at the last launch, which showed that we're selling more iPads than the, anybody who's selling PCs, who's in the PC business. I mean, we're selling a lot of iPads. You know, jeez, well, tough customer. Why are they falling? Why are sales falling? Uh, again, I'm not the iPad expert. All I can tell you is that it's a great device. Our goal is about making the best device. I think we've, we continue to do that. Do you know a better tablet? Uh, I'm on record. I guess I'm trapped. I'm on record. <laughs> I don't know a better tablet. Use no. your words against you. you but know? I also, and, but and, I and also, that's our, and that's our goal. If we do that, Walt, back to the earlier statements, everything else is going to work. Everything else is going to fall in place. We're about creating the best products, the best experience. I think, I think we've just done that again. All right. Questions? Yeah, Alan Worms, Appalicious. Uh, this might be too inside baseball for you, but uh, there was a presentation this morning, or I talked this morning, a lot of conversations about deep linking between apps mm -hmm. as a way to improve the consumer experience. You can jump in between apps. And right now, 
app developers have to do, either figure out all the URI deep, you know, URI resource strings themselves, or go to a third party to find it, or there's these third party emerging mm -hmm. parties. What's Apple's philosophy on that? Do you plan, why not just provide those to the ecosystem yourself? Why make everybody jump through hoops if in fact you think it's going to be a great consumer experience to just jump app to app to app? Yeah, I mean, we do some all right right now. If you're, if you're aware, if you go searching through a website of somebody who has a, an, an app, it will show you that the app exists and it will deep link you into the app. Uh, it's certainly a conversation I'm, uh, I'm welcome, I'd love to have more. I think it's some good feedback. And you guys opened up iOS in a few ways with iOS 8. A, a, a lot of ways, and I think we did it in an, an Apple sort of way, which is we, we, in iOS 8, which is an enormous release for developers, we, we allowed developers to do things to the platform we've never allowed before, but we did it in a way that was still maintain the security model, because that in the end is, 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 is an important thing, right? We don't want a lot of malware, we don't want the, the viruses that exist on other mobile platforms to be something we have to deal with in iOS. So I think we did that uh, in, a, in a nice Apple sort of way. Phil Goldstein from Fierce Wireless. Regarding Phil, the, Phil, I think you ask a question at every session. I, hey, I'm here, you know. <laughs> Nobody else is asking. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Apple SIM. You mentioned that you know, one of the reasons why it works for the iPad is that you guys don't necessarily know which carrier a customer is going to go with when they buy an iPad as opposed to an iPhone. But an iPad is a data-only device, and you guys pretty much have put all of the different LTE bands into a single iPad model. And you don't do that necessarily with all the iPhone models, which also have to have voice bands. So is that one of the reasons why it's a better fit for the iPad as opposed to the iPhone? Yeah, we actually put over 20 LTE bands in the new iPhone 6 and iPhone 6 Plus as well, as well as the new iPad uh, Air 2. So that is something that we pride ourselves on because that is by far more than anybody does. And it's expensive and it's hard engineering to do that, but that's, again, part of that customer experience. We want, we want people to be able to travel, roam, and be able to use you know, LTE networks, especially as LTE roaming has become a reality now, that people do have agreements to, to roam um, with LTE, and no one has a type of band support. So it is in the new iPhones as well. Yes. Ari Reisman with Glide. Um, I can see Apple Watch sales exceeding iPhone sales within five years. Very excited about this new platform. You may want to talk to Ina later on. Well, you'll need an iPhone, right? Because it, it doesn't work too much <laughs> disconnected, so I'm not sure how that will extend. Well, OK, but th this is Gen 1. Of course, they'll have their own SIM cards eventually. And they'll also have their own front-facing cameras. So <laughs> curious to hear uh, what your thoughts are on that and what we can expect in terms of time frame. Yeah, I, again, I can't offer you the most deep, full thought, uh, deep thoughts on Apple Watch, even though Walt will tell me I should. I'm the Apple guy. Uh, you know, Obviously, we're doing quite well with our front-facing cameras on both iPhones and iPads. Uh, to Ina's point, right now, the, I, you know, the iPhone and the Apple Watch are certainly meant to work great together. Uh, and part of that, of course, is using that camera. What about, what are the capabilities um, that comes with the new things? You guys are using it for Apple Pay, but it has other uses, is NFC. Mm -hmm. um, at least if I'm understanding correctly, for now, even Beats, which Apple owns, I, that has tap to pair with NFC. It'll work with an Android phone, but it, Apple doesn't allow NFC for other uses. Do you think that's a temporary thing, just so you make sure you get payments great? I think yeah, if there's a word that you'll hear maybe a handful of words that you'll hear throughout our, uh, certainly our, our last 17 or so years, one of them is focus. You know? And certainly we saw NFC prime, you know, number one with number two a long ways away, right? being about how to enable mobile payments. And we wanted to put all the efforts around doing that right. And, and that's the focus we chose. So maybe something, but not for quite a while. Yeah, again, our focus right now is we got, we got still a long way to go on Apple right. Pay. We've started, and uh, we're going to get a lot further on that. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Walt. Really appreciate it. <laughs>